And we're back in the diamond lane. And our special guests are here. Carl Funk in his first hometown solo show. Where else better than at the Winnipeg Art Gallery? It closes on the 2nd of October, and we want to make sure that you get there to see his fantastic, inspiring work. The man who spends time in New York, but still chooses to come back to Winnipeg, where he calls this lovely town of ours home. Welcome, Carl, to the Diamond Lane. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. No, it's such a pleasure. So, I mean... To, for our listeners who aren't necessarily aware of who you are, um, talk about what led you to do your degree, your undergrad, at the University of Manitoba. Um, well, you know, I was always interested in painting and, and drawing as a kid and kind of stopped doing that for a while. thought I'd become a professional skateboarder. Mm-hmm. Okay. Didn't, didn't turn out. It was pretty painful. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, after that kind of, uh, that dream kind of faded away, I started to draw and paint again. Mm. And I became very serious about that, and I want to get better. I want to learn more about painting, the history of painting. So uh-huh. I applied to do my uh, BFA at the University of Manitoba. So what? What was there? A painting? Was there a, a, a painter that was you know that that took you out of of yourself in that that first time? Um, well, you know, I talk about Chuck Close a lot because in mm. my first year, um, I mean, I knew a little bit about some classic painters. Kandinsky, Picasso, those books are around my, my house a lot cool. when I was growing up. Van Gogh, you know, some of the heavy hitters everybody knows about. Mm-hmm. But I didn't know a lot about uh, New York artists that were contemporaries. So uh, when I started taking um, art history classes and just being in, in around other artists in, at the U of M, um, I learned more about painters. And Chuck Close was a big influence on, mm-hmm. on my work uh, earlier on in my career. Yeah. Well, you know, your work with light and fabric and crinkling of things, I mean, that is, that's a big part of, of this exhibition, definitely this kind of, uh, this discreet intimacy, sort of, with these kind of cloaked figures, these etudes in outerwear. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, but um, tell us, I mean, what inspired these, these kind of appreciations for the obscured um, well, you know, that, I guess that really started when I moved to New York to do my MFA. Okay. Um, you know, I, I was taking a lot of art history classes again, mm-hmm. uh, the history of Renaissance portraiture, oh. and I was spending a lot of time going to uh, the Metropolitan Museum of Art and the Frick Collection. And um, I just really had a chance to, to see all those beautiful Renaissance portraits up close and to see how preciously they were painted. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I wouldn't necessarily um, worry too much about the history of the person in the portrait, but I look at the craftsmanship, uh, the folds and creases in the, in the fabric. Mm-hmm. And I really started just, just to, to love the formal qualities of those paintings. And at the same time, I was taking the subway around the city, getting used to being in such a, a densely populated city. Um, and I became aware of this moment where you could almost be a, an urban voyeur, where you could be, you know, you're crammed really close to a stranger subway, the subway's packed, it's rush hour, or, you know, a busy street corner, or even a pub, just getting in line to buy a drink, and people are bumping into each other. And there's these moments where you can be shoulder to shoulder with a stranger, and you can see, um, for a minute, you can be a voyeur, you can see, you know, the stubble on their neck, or maybe some dandruff on their shoulder, or, you know, the inside of the earring on the on the inside of a, a earlobe. And, you know, this kind of happened over a couple of years, but somehow those two experiences became melded into one to become sort of my muse for the portraits that I work on now, where there's elements of um, having an urban gaze experience where the person that I've painted in the portrait is, is turned away. They're not aware of your presence. So you can get up close to them and you can see their details, much like you would in those, those urban situations I was talking about. And at the same time, um, I, I started to use contemporary um, synthetic jackets as sort of like a bridge to sort of uh, find a, a, a place between the present and the past because those contemporary jackets would be signifiers that would uh, reference the Renaissance portraits that, that I would look at quite a bit. So, you know, this, this took about two, maybe three years for this to all sort of find its way into, um, into a, a portrait format, but that's really how it began. My long answer. <laughs> but that was a, it was a fascinating and dense long answer, but it was, I mean, exactly what we needed to know. I feel uh, that 
that neo-Renaissance, um, whatever message that you're trying to accomplish, I think that it, it, it has been communicated uh, really successfully. So, I mean, how how did the show, your first solo exhibition here in Winnipeg, your hometown, how did that end up being at the WAG? Did that have anything to do with our friend Andrew Keir over here? It did. Um it did, did quite a bit. In fact, Andrew has, you know, he's done everything to make the show happen. Um, I'll have to give credit to Paul Butler, an artist in the city, because yeah. he was a contemporary curator uh, at the WAG, maybe was it two years ago now? Yeah. And he, he brought the idea to me, presented it to Stephen Boris, and, and then Paul moved on to other projects. And Andrew Keir um, took over the, the entire concept of the, the WAG show at that point. So everything that has to do with getting a, that show together, you know, selecting the work. It was his vision um, to select the, uh, these works for the show, to, to lay the work out the way you see it now in all the different rooms, um, organizing the loans. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of work that goes into making a show like this happen, and, mm -hmm. and Andrew really put it together. Amazing. You know, let's talk really quickly uh, about your relationship with New York and particularly with Gallery 303. Uh, but first, I mean, you have paintings in the Guggenheim, you have them in the Whitney. Like, wow, nice work, friend. Well, uh, <laughs> like, <laughs> thanks. But, you know, it, it's also um, 303 Gallery. They, they have done an amazing job just to, to promote the work. And, um, it's really a relationship between, I believe, between the artist and, and the gallery in a situation mm -hmm. like that to, to find homes, you know, for the paintings, to, to get them into good collections, to get curators interested in the work, mm -hmm. um, promote it to institutions. So, you know, I do the hard work of, of painting the paintings, but they do the hard work of interfacing with the art world at large. And it's a lot of work. Does that have anything to do also with the fact that you did your MFA at Columbia? Do they have a connection with Columbia or was... Um, a little bit. When I, was t when I was a student there in 2001 to 2003, um, there was an artist from 303, Collier Shore, mm -hmm. who was doing a class called, they called it a mentorship, where you'd spend a week with, with um, one artist who'd come into the, the program. I think there was about a dozen people in the class, and um, you would spend that week just going through everybody's studios, becoming very intimate, very friendly, and really getting to know each other. And she really enjoyed my work and uh, felt that my work would, would fit in well at 303 Gallery. So she was really the catalyst to sort of get a dialogue started to get into 303, um, because some galleries in New York can have so many people wanting to, to drop off CVs. They don't even look at CVs or resumes, and it doesn't really work that way all the time to, to get into a gallery. So she was sort of the, really the, the, the person who started a dialogue. Excellent. Yeah. Well, you're lucky to have her. I'm very grateful for <laughs> and that. And you're yes. also <laughs> lucky to have Andrew, who I didn't, Andrew, let, let's just talk really quick. Didn't you produce this uh, piece that we've been seeing on the WAG's website and also on our website? Uh, piece? The the film, uh, oh. the short documentary. Right. Well, I, I was the I was the behind the scenes carrying equipment in New York and things like that. Uh, I guess that's the role of a, sort of a producer. But no, the, the film itself was done by... Uh, a wonderful uh, Winnipeg filmmaker by the name of Kalen Vatnestal. And uh, so we, it's a 20 minute uh, sort of look at the way Carl paints, how he paints, uh, including interviews with him. And it also includes this footage of us romp romping through the Frick Collection and the Metropolitan Museum. Which is so beautiful, by the way. Absolutely. Um, just exhilarating. After hours access, it was a little surreal. And we really have to thank the both institutions for letting us get through there. You lucky guys. Yep. Yeah, amazing. Well, we are very excited to have your first f solo show at the WAG and be able to be part of it and get to witness it here in Winnipeg finally. Um, and uh, thank you both for coming in, uh, Andrew, again, and Carl for the first time. Uh, welcome to the Diamond Lane. Uh, and uh, you can catch this exhibit until October 2nd at the Winnipeg Art Gallery. Go to wag.ca for more info, or you can go to our website, classic107.com. Uh, gentlemen, it's a pleasure. Um, please come back anytime you want. Thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure. Okay. We are going to go to a short break and then come back with one more little bit of dance. Uh, but once again, Andrew Keir, Carl Funk, it's been a pleasure. We'll see you soon.